what elements could knock their socks off? Is it uh, something like plot that hits you in the face, a uh, new type of character or setting? Is it style? What are the elements you have um, you might control that you, you're trying to get that huge effect out of for the agent who reads it, the editor? I'm Cal Newport, and this is Deep Questions, episode 225. I'm here in my Deep Work HQ, joined by my producer, Jesse. Jesse, as you know, I've been excited about this episode. It's featuring an interview that I've been wanting to do for a long time, which is an interview with a full-time working New York Times best-selling thriller writer. Yeah, you've been talking about this. I don't know why I've had this stuck in my head for a while, but uh, but I have. Uh, so the interview that's going to come up later in the show is with my friend J.T. Ellison, who you can find out about at jtellison.com. Uh, she's a New York Times best-selling author of more than 25 novels that collectively have millions of copies in print. So she writes standalone thrillers. I have some of the names here, including It's One of Us and Her Dark Lies. Uh, I think she got started with her Lieutenant Taylor Jackson series, a detective thriller series, which began with All the Pretty Girls. She also writes the Dr. Samantha Owen series and is a Emmy award-winning host of a author TV show based out of Nashville called A Word on Words. I've actually appeared on that show, I think last year and enjoyed that as well. Anyways, here's the reason why I wanted to have a thriller writer on the show. Um, I am very interested in this world. I talked to JT about, first of all, her path from leaving a job here in DC as a political marketer or something like this, or maybe an aerospace defense marketer. I don't know, a, a beltway inside the beltway style job left, moved to Tennessee, became a thriller writer. I wanted to know about that. I pushed her on why exactly did you succeed? So, so what was it specifically? We get into the details that you did that the 10 other people trying to become thriller writers at that same time didn't do that meant you succeeded and they didn't. So we really get into the details of what actually makes the difference in finding traction in a career or just being someone who occasionally does national novel writing month and then gives up. We get into the economics of the world of thriller writing and how that's been changing. What's it really like to be a full-time writer? We get into the weeds about social media and email list and the struggle to, to be a full-time creative and also manage an audience. She explains to me who Colleen Hoover is and tries to bring me in on that phenomenon, which I never quite understand. Uh, we get into her habits. How does she write? When does she write? How does she manage her day? And then best of all, the real reason why we did this interview at the end, I say, okay, JT, imagine that there is a million dollar bounty that you can reap. If I successfully, me, Cal, successfully sell a thrill, thriller novel, what's the advice you're giving me? What's the game plan you're giving me to ensure that you win that bounty? What's your inside, insider track, experience-based game plan? If you really want to succeed at, at selling a thriller, what would you recommend to someone like me doing? And so we get that advice. But here's the bigger picture. Whether you're interested in thriller writing or not, the context for this interview is that JT lives what looks like to a lot of us a deep life. She does something that's interesting and unique and radical and has a lot of control over her life and her circumstances. She's crafted a really interesting life. I mean, she's doing ride-alongs with the Nashville police and going out to Quantico to learn about body decomposition. She spent a lot of time with survivalists researching another book she wrote. She writes all day. She's friends with all these cool, really famous thriller writers. I mean, it sounds like a really interesting deep life. And I like the idea of occasionally doing these interviews where we decode an actual deep life. Here's what went into it. Here's how the transition occurred. Here's what makes it sustainable. Here's the joys and also the sorrows of uh, the reality of these type of, uh, these type of trajectories in life. So I think it's just a good general case study of deep living. Uh, but also is an excuse for me to finally write the book. And Jesse knows the book I'm going to write. It's going to call be called The Last Name of the Wind. So sort of like a response to The Name of the Wind. And uh, throughout the book, 
I am going to inaccurately reference. Uh, now I can't remember his name. Now here's the real irony. Now I can only remember the name of the person who actually wrote Name of the Wind, which is Patrick Rufus. Brandon Sanderson. If you're new to this show, you're probably about to be old to this show because everything I just said right there makes no sense. But you know what? Jesse gets it. I get it. We have like seven <laughs> older fans who know what I'm talking about here. So this is for you guys. Anyway, so we got that interview. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, before, before we get into that though, I have a deep dive I want to do that's on a topic that's completely different. So the topic I want to discuss might seem unusual at first, but there is a backstory here I will, I will quickly tell you. Here it is. Did Alan Turing invent the computer? All right, why are we talking about this? Well, it goes back to last week. I was a guest on Sam Harris's podcast, Making Sense. I don't know if you've heard that one yet, Jesse. Uh, but it's an episode that's creating quite a stir, not because of me but because the episode is uh, begins with a 45 minute monologue from Sam where he explains why he decided a few days before that episode posted to quit Twitter. So here is where if we had a, a applause sound effect, a confetti and applause sound effect is where, where we would, where we would hear it. So Sam quit uh, Twitter and it sort of made sense to attach his announcement about that to this interview I'd recorded with him a few weeks earlier, because obviously when you talk to Cal Newport, you're going to, you're going to hear a lot about tech and tech and society and not a necessarily very positive view of Twitter. Now, interestingly in that interview, later in the interview, and we're talking about Twitter, Sam is cataloging a lot of his concerns about it. And I took a swing and made a pitch in the interview directly, Sam, you should quit Twitter. Now, I don't get to take credit for that. Sam actually specifically addresses this at the end of his monologue. He says, as you will hear, I already had doubts when I was doing this interview and Cal was pushing me to quit it. I didn't quit Twitter because Cal told me to, but he was one of the voices in my head when I made the decision. So I'm going to take, let's take a partial W. Yeah. <laughs> on that, Jesse. Um, but anyways, obviously I'm glad he did it, not just for his own sanity, but I think because it's a role model. Uh, as longtime listeners... No, my issue is not with the existence of these social media platforms. It is with the assumption of ubiquity. That I think is what the problem is. The idea that everyone has to use the platform. That's what I, that's what I mind. I don't care that Twitter exists. I care that it's a big deal that I don't use it. And so when we have more high profile people like Sam opt out, it opens up that possibility to others, others who maybe feel like the cost or outweighing the benefits, it makes it easier and easier for those who follow in his wake to say, you know what, I'm going to do something similar. I got a lot of heat when I originally left Twitter. Sam, who's way more well known to me, is getting a huge amount of heat right now. But more of us who go through this, the easier it will become for those who follow. So I think that's all good news. Anyways, it's a long interview. A lot of it we're dealing with tech issues, a lot of tech and society, a lot of tech criticism, very interesting stuff, a lot of new theories you haven't heard me talk about before, worth listening to. But earlier in the show, Sam and I wandered across a bunch of esoteric topics that just sort of popped to our head as we were chatting. And one of the topics that came up relatively early in the conversation was this thought experiment that Sam had considered before, where he was thinking, if I could go back in time, somewhere between the 1930s and the 1940s, and uh, let's say kill a single individual, if my goal was to delay as long as possible the development of the modern computer, which individual would you kill? Now, obviously, that's a maybe a, a, a violent construction for what's an actually a very interesting question. You know, who was probably most singly influentially responsible for the development of the modern computer? I thought that was a cool thought experiment, so we got into it. Now, one of the names that often comes to people's mind when they think about the invention of the computer is Alan Turing. And as Sam and I talked about, I think Turing gets too much credit as a uh, initiator of the development of modern digital computing. I'm a huge Alan Turing fan. I teach Turing to our doctoral students at Georgetown. I know his work very well. He's the father of theoretical computer science, an incredibly influential thinker and a very original thinker. But his role 
in the invention of the computer, I think has been inflated in recent decades. He would not be, in other words, my choice of who to go back and, and uh, rub out if I was trying to delay the development of the computer. Now, I'll tell you soon who I think that person is. But first, let's return to the question of Turing. So what did he do that became so connected to computing in the modern minds? Well, it really comes down to the notion of the Turing machine. If you want to understand the notion of the Turing machine, and I promise you I'm not going to get into professor mode here. I'll be very brief. But if we want to get into the notion of the uh, Turing machine, you have to go back to this paper he wrote called On Computable Numbers and Their Connection to the Einstein Problem, which is a, a German name for a problem that was posed in the late 19th century by David Hilbert. Now, this problem had nothing to do with computers. This is from the 1800s. But what it asked is, can we come up with what they would call back then an effective procedure? Today, we might call this an algorithm, but back then they would call it an effective procedure. That is a step-by-step -step series of instructions for solving any math problem we might want to solve. Does every math problem have a step-by-step -step way to solve it? This was a big question in mathematical logic. A lot of people were working on it, and Turing came up with an answer. And the way he came up with an answer is he said, let's, let's have a formal definition of an effective procedure. And that's when he came up with this thought experiment of the Turing machine. It's a, a, a set of instructions, an infinite tape, a read head that can move from position to position on the tape, read what's there, look up in the instructions what to do, maybe overwrite what's there, move one direction or the other. Turing made this argument that this abstract machine, in theory, could implement any possible effective procedure. So every effective procedure has a corresponding Turing machine. He then did a, a bit of mathematical logical tricks where he said, look, we could describe any such Turing machine with a sequence of whole numbers. And we could just put those whole numbers together and just get a really big whole number. So every Turing machine and therefore every effective procedure has a corresponding whole number. Now it might be really big. It might be a couple hundred thousand digits long, but just conceptually speaking, there is a, a way to label every possible effective procedure with the whole number. Then he looked at, what do we mean by a problem? And he, he focused in on a, on a subset of problems you might try to solve. These were called decision problems. He did a little bit of mathematical logic. And he argued every problem can be represented by a real number. That is a, a number, a decimal point number that has an infinite number of decimal places. You know, one point zero one four six five seven eight off into infinity. And in fact, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence there that you could you could take every real number, and that uh, exactly describes a particular decision problem. This was a big deal because there is a well-known result going back to Cantor. Now we're going back to the 19th century that says there are many more real numbers than natural numbers. There exists no way to map every natural number onto a real number such that you've covered all the real numbers. The impact of that is, okay, if we, uh, if we map every possible effective procedure to the problem it solves, there will be many problems left over that aren't being mapped to by an effective procedure. Math, 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 logic, logic, logic. And the conclusion is there's many more problems out there in the universe than there are algorithms or effective procedures that can solve them. Most things that, uh, most problems out there can't be solved by effective procedures procedures. This was the question that Hilbert was trying to answer. Turing answered it. So this was all about logic, mathematical logic, foundational math that was going on right then. None of this had to do with computers. The reason why we connect this to modern digital computing is you can say Turing's notion of a, a Turing machine uh, is an abstract notion of a computer because you have this, the, the tape could have on it instructions that a Turing machine could run. He talked about in his original paper, something called the universal Turing machine, where the input on the tape is a description of another Turing machine and it simulates it. So you do have some of the conceptual basics there of a computer reading a program and executing it. Okay, fair enough. Also, we do know that von Neumann at Princeton was familiar with Turing's work. He met Turing when Turing was visiting the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Von Neumann later advanced the von Neumann architecture for modern computers, which is the one we use today. So there's a little bit of an influence there as well. But the idea that Turing single-handedly sort of introduced this idea that we could have these universal computing machines, that's just not true. Before Turing even did this work, well before this work was well known outside of esoteric mathematical circles, 
we already had general purpose analog electronic computers. We had, for example, Vannevar Bush's differential analyzer at MIT. In the mid 1930s, we got the very first, we began to get the very first ideas being proposed for making fully electronic com computing machines. As the war went on, there was a huge push to have more advanced electronic computing. They were using these to calculate artillery tables and to help aim anti-aircraft guns and some sort of cybernetic sense. There's a huge research effort for this. And while it's true that Turing, after the war, got involved in a project in the UK to develop an electronic computer, this was one of at least a half dozen ongoing projects, uh, many of which finished sooner. I think the ENIAC at Penn, for example, there was a Van Neumann's project at Princeton. There was a project going on at Harvard. A lot of people were working on this problem and they didn't need Turing to do it. Uh, the final thing people point to is they saw that, that movie uh, about whatever it was called, the uh, imitation game. And like, well, didn't he invent these sort of computing machines to break the Enigma code? No, those were developed by the Poles. The Polish uh, code breakers developed those. Turing was just building a more advanced version of those machines. They had more funding. So they used to, the initial work that the Poles had, had put into breaking the Enigma and then they expanded it. I love Turing, but he didn't invent the computer. So who would I go back and rub out if I was trying to delay the computer? I would say Claude Shannon in the early 1930s. Claude Shannon in the early 1930s wrote the most important master thesis that anyone has ever written before. It was called A Symbolic Analysis of Relay and Switching Circuits. This master thesis is what figured out the entire field of digital electronics. This was the really key breakthrough that everything else was built on. Shannon had been interning at Bell Labs where he was seeing electromagnetic relays Phone networks use electromagnetic relays to automatically connect calls using electrical signals. He was also studying for a degree in mathematics at MIT. He put those two things together and he said, wait a second, you can take purely logical statements expressed in Boolean algebra and you can implement them with electronic circuits using these electromechanic relays. So you can take an arbitrary mathematical specification of a logical circuit and build it. Anything you can come up with, any Boolean algebra statement you can come up with. We have a systematic way of building that with wires and magnets. We can build an electronic circuit. I have a quote. He said this later in life. It just happened that no one else was familiar with both of these fields at the same time. So he happened to be in both worlds. Math, phone company came together. That was probably the single biggest innovation because once we realized we can build arbitrary logic into electrical circuits, that's what opened up the whole hope that whatever idea we have that we want to implement, whatever adding circuit or logic circuit or whatever we need to implement our conceptual de design of a computer, whatever we can come up with, if we can specify it mathematically, we can build it. So if we're going to follow this sort of oddly martial ex exploration of early computing, Shannon in the 30s, Getting rid of Shannon in the 30s would probably have a bigger impact than getting rid of Turing in the 30s. So there we go. So I geeked out with Sam, and I thought I would use this as an occasion to geek out with you as well. We're going to shift gears completely and get to our interview with J.T. Ellison. Let's talk about thriller writing. Let's stop talking about electro circuits. Uh, but before we get there, I want to briefly first mention one of the sponsors that makes this show possible. I want to talk in particular about our friends at Henson Shaving. You've heard me talk about this before. It is one of my favorite personal hygiene project products, rather, uh, that I've come across in the last couple of years. What it is, is a precision manufactured aluminum shaving razor. It is manufactured by a company that is previously known for their work on manufacturing high precision aerospace components. We're talking about components for the Mars rover, components for the International Space Station. So they have these super precise CNC routers that can, that can carve metal within incredibly fine tolerances. And they put all this equipment to use at building this better razor. So what matters when you're shaving is how much blade you have exposed to actually shave against the skin. If you have no blade exposed, obviously you can't do any shaving. If you have too much blade sticking out, you get what's known as the diving board effect. 
the blade goes up and down like a diving board. It can get stuck. It can cause nicks. So what you want is just a very, very thin edge of a blade exposed past the edge of your razor. This is what Henson is able to accomplish with their precisely milled aluminum razors. I have the number right here. The amount of blade that sticks out is 0 0.0013 inches, less than the thickness of a human hair. So you have a secure blade, a stable blade, and a vibration-free shave. But because of that, you only need one blade. A standard 10-cent safety razor blade, when put into this very precisely milled aluminum razor, gives you an excellent shave. I just shaved with my Henson this morning. So you get this beautiful object. Maybe you pay a little bit more for it up front. But thereon, going forward in your life as someone who shaves, you can just use these 10-cent razors in this beautiful shaver. I think it is the, uh, it's the right way to shave. I'm definitely a big fan. So it's say it's time to say no to those expensive subscription service or those pharmacy brand razors that have the, whatever it is now, 17 or 18 vibrating blades and get a razor that will actually last you a lifetime. Visit hensonshavingcom slash Cal to pick the razor for you and use the code Cal and you will get two years worth of blades for free. Uh, along with your razor. Just make sure that you add those two years worth of blades to your cart and then check out with the promo code Cal and the price will be set to zero. So that's 100 free blades when you head to H-E-N-S-O-N-S-H-A-V-I-N-G.com slash Cal and use that code Cal. I also want to talk about our friends at 8Sleep. The 8Sleep pod is the ultimate sleep machine. It is a sleep technology that dynamically cools and heats each side of your bed to maintain an optimal sleeping temperature. You can start sleeping as cool as 55 degrees or as hot as 110 degrees Fahrenheit, and you can set both sides of the bed to different temperatures. I use an eight sleep pod on my mattress and I swear by it. We've talked about this on the show. I'm almost a little bit mad by eight, uh, at eight sleep because now when I travel, I miss it. I didn't realize what I was missing until I actually have it. And it's because I'm a hot sleeper. And if you're a hot sleeper, what happens is at the beginning of the night, you put on all the covers because your mattress is nice and cool. It's been empty all day. You feel great. You wake up an hour later and you're frying because all of your heat has built up in the mattress and it's too hot. With the eight sleep, it's cooling technology just keeps whisking that heat away. And so the whole night you feel like when you first get into the bed, you're comfortable the whole night. They have all this data they've sent me about how it helps people recover and sleep better. I'll give you the data point of Cal. I sleep better with my eight sleep. I now dislike when I don't have an eight sleep to actually sleep on. So the pod is not magic, but for me, it feels like it. So go to eightsleep.com slash deep and you will save $150 on the pod. That's eightsleep.com slash deep for $150 off. 8sleep currently ships within the USA, Canada, the UK, select countries in the EU, and Australia. All right, that's enough with the sponsors. Let's go on now with our interview with thriller writer J.T. Ellison. All right, well, I'm here with J.T. Ellison. Uh, J.T., thank you for, for coming on to the podcast. I've been telling people oh, my audience is really interested in uh, genre fiction writing, making a living as a writer. But the reality is really just I'm very interested in this topic. And so like secretly I'm using my podcast as an excuse to, to just pick your brain about all things about being a professional fiction writer. So, so thank you for indulging me here. Absolutely. Thanks for wanting to be interested in it. It's, you know, I still think you've got a novel in you. I feel it ready to come out. Yes. You say that and my, my nonfiction editor feels yes. like a, a disturbance <laughs> in the force. <laughs> like when something is not right here. Uh, got so time. I got time. That's right. That's right. Um, so what I was thinking here is three parts. I wanted to start talking about uh, your story, which I think from my audience perspective is actually like a nice deep life case study. Then I want to get into the weeds with the publishing industry and how that works and where it's going. And there's some stuff we've been talking about on the show that we're going to get the, the real scoop on from you. Um, and then have some advice questions towards the end about people 
uh, people looking to do something similar <laughs> in their <laughs> lives. Yeah, let's imagine there's a 40 year old professor, nonfiction writer. Uh, let's just call him Kyle, who uh, wants to write a novel. So we'll get there. We'll get there later. Awesome. <laughs> um, so I want to start with your story. Uh, in particular, from what I understand, your story picks up, you're around my neck of the woods at first. You're a denizen mm -hmm. of DC and politics and go from there to thriller writing. How do you typically relay that story of DC <laughs> to bestsellerdom? Yeah, that, it is kind of a circuitous route, right? My parents uh, moved us to DC when I was 15 and I went to Langley. So I lived in McLean. And my mom worked uh, uh, in the White House. My dad worked for Lockheed Martin. And I, you know, I was an English wonk, right? I absolutely loved it and knew that I wanted to be a writer and English was always my best class. And so I went to school to get a creative writing degree. But living inside the Beltway, you can't not get bitten by that bug. It's such a unique place. It, it, you have to be plugged into it. You have to be interested in it. And so I also majored in political science. So I had a dual major. Um, and when it was time to go to grad school to go get my MFA that had been the plan all along, my professor said, you are not good enough to get published, which I listened to. And at the time, I probably wasn't. But you know, what are you going to do when someone you respect just flat out says, you don't have it? This is like a, an, an English professor, a literature professor. Yeah, it was my at thesis. College. Advisor. Your thesis. Mm -hmm. and, and was your thesis uh, literary? Like, what was he? It judging? was. It was, okay. it was short stories and poems and, you know, all the things that you need for an MFA uh, program. And yeah, so so I would. All right. I'm interested in politics as well. I'm going to go to graduate school. And so I, I went to GW and got a degree in political management, thinking that I would run campaigns. Okay. Um, worked in the White House, which was a lot of fun. Worked um, post White House in aerospace marketing, as you do when your dad works for Lockheed Martin <laughs> and your candidate loses. <laughs> you don't have a lot of choices in the, in the market at that moment. And then we moved to Nashville and I turned into a bad country music song. Um, yeah. I, I couldn't find a job. My cat died. I finally went to work for a vet and ended up having back surgery. Three days in, I blew out my back and had to have back surgery. And while I was recovering, I went to the library and asked if they had any new authors for me to try. And she said, have you ever read John Sanford? I've always been a big thriller reader. She said, have you ever read John Sanford? I said, no. And, and she gave me the first three prey books. Sure. And I was three books in and went, this is it. I'm, I'm going to try this. And I, I told my husband, I want to write a book. And he said, go for it. Yeah, I think I was driving him kind of crazy anyway, not having anything to do. <laughs> and that was it. I, I wrote that first paragraph and went, wow, I'm home. So a little uh, eight year gap. I mean, you, you said once, I think on the, the Oprah Network documentary, that there was some transition point where you're like, I'm now doing this full time. And you said it was the most peaceful moment I've ever had. What was the transition point? Was it writing the first paragraph? Was it publishing mm -hmm. the first book? When, when did you get that piece of I'm doing this full time and that makes me happy? It, it was the first period on that first paragraph. I literally burst into tears because I, I, I had been gone from what I was meant to be doing I'm meant to be a writer. That is my path. It's always been my path. And I diverged and did a lot of really cool things, but I chafed at the bit through the whole thing. I, I don't play well with others. I don't like being told what to do. <laughs> you know, being a writer is, is absolutely perfect for folks like me who you know have a lot of ambition, but don't like people guiding them through that. Um, but yeah, and, and I got lucky really fast. I mean, I wrote... <laughs> I'll be honest. I wrote what I thought was a novel and sent it all over New York. And turns out it was actually um, a novella. And you're not supposed to submit directly. You're supposed to get an agent. I just literally had no idea. But then I found out and realized, and okay, I went back and rewrote it, made it a real novel, submitted, was looking for agents. My agent found me, which was fabulous. 
And then he submitted that book to seven publishers and they all rejected it. And I got to loop back to the college <laughs> moment of you're not good enough to get published. I'm like, well, yeah. maybe I'm not. But he said, write me another book. And I did. And that one sold in a three book deal and the rest is history. And that all happened in about a two and a half year period. So it happened very quickly. I got really lucky really fast. Interesting. Well, let's, let's do the Tim Ferriss thing here, which is <laughs> backing up to, uh, you said, I discovered after you sent the novella around, I discovered this is not how it works. This is not a mm -hmm. novel. Um, what does discovered mean? I mean, did you, where did you get, <laughs> did you, where did you get, did you get insider information? I want to know about how you figured out, oh, this is how the industry works, that re refocusing of your effort. It's just, it's so embarrassing to, to, you know, look back on that now of just, wow, I was such a, a enthusiastic kid. And, um, I did uh, go to a book signing. I went to my first book signing and met um, an author named John Connolly, who I absolutely worship. Just, he's incredible. And he very kindly, I, I went determined that I was going to talk to him. And when I did, I said, can I buy you a drink? And he says, well, we are all going out for drinks. Why don't you come with? And I, I grabbed my husband and off we went. And John was so incredibly gracious with me. He explained a lot about how to get an agent, um, offered to send my book to his agent when it was ready, asked me the elevator pitch, which I completely botched. <laughs> and he was like, okay, you need to work on that. And he just, he just extended me so much grace. And that is something I have found in this industry. After that night, I met a couple other people that were there to see him. One was a woman who had a critique group um, and she belonged to an organization called Sisters in Crime. And they have you know, their own critique groups within that. It was an online forum that you could get in and actually talk to other writers. And suddenly I went from working in a vacuum alone in, in my house to having a community. And, and it was, it was incredibly fulfilling very, right. very quickly to suddenly know, wow, there are people out there doing this yeah. and they taught me a lot. I mean, the critique group really taught me how to write. I might have a degree in writing, but I didn't know how to write. <laughs> well, because that's what I'm interested in is how you figure out like literally how to craft a, a book in a particular genre. And so was it the critique? The critique group is this, I mean, I've heard you talk about interviews before, like learning how to make dialogue naturalistic right. was a, like a big turning point. Was this the type of feedback that was coming out of, out of the group? Like what was the instruction that helped you actually learn this specific craft? There were two huge things. One is a process and one is craft. The process part was we had to show up with 10 pages every other week. Okay. So I started getting that discipline of having to write and have new work every two weeks to go in for them. And then you read it out loud and they critiqued it. And, you know, they said, why, why is this character doing this? Why would she, you know, why is Taylor not talking to Baldwin? But, you know, all of those little nitty gritty details that as readers and writers, the story wasn't working for them. And I would go back and I would work on it. And then I would fix all that and move forward. And it propelled me through the first several books that I wrote, learning, you know, and, and then the first time you get copy edited, that, that helps a lot. <laughs> that helps a lot. All the little things that you don't realize you're doing, all the MFA mistakes that, you know, I would have been making in yep. a more literary novel that don't fit into the thriller. That was, you know, that was very eye opening, very eye opening. So I, I had, I've always had this theory, which I don't know if it's correct or not. So tell me if I have the right framework for understanding the, the fiction publishing world. So, so it seemed to me that there's two thresholds. Like, so there's a, uh, a amateur professional threshold. So that, that's the threshold of you've learned a craft. Like you're, you, it's, it's actually, if you read this, it wouldn't catch your attention as an editor is like, oh, this is not a professional thriller writer. It has to craft right, the idiom right, everything right. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's this other threshold of, okay, is this particular idea or this particular author something we want to, that catches our attention? Is that a good way of thinking of it? Like it's a, it's a dual threshold thing. You have to get above amateur level plus then 
have the whatever the idea that catches the that, the attention. Absolutely, and and I have an absolutely perfect example of that. Okay. Um, one of the best rejections I ever got was for the what was the novella at the time, and the editor came back and said, "This is great. The writing's great. Characters are great. I love it." There is nothing that elevates it past every other submission that I get. I'm like, Whoa, ouch. You know, that, that is really a painful thing to hear, but it also gave me that, okay, what do I need to do to level this up? I got to level up if I have any hope of making it into getting an agent, getting a, getting a publishing house. You know, the 1% of authors get agents and 1% of the agented submissions get deals. It's a very small number, which is amazing considering the millions of books that are published every year. Um, all that creativity out there. Wow. Yeah. But, <laughs> okay, I'm getting aside. The, I deconstructed, after that happened, I sat down with the Sanford novel and a Lee Child novel, a Tammy Hogue novel, Erica Spindler, Alex mm -hmm. Caba, and a couple others. And I, de I used my, my good creative writing degree and I deconstructed the novels and looked at how does it open? Who is coming into the scene? Who is the scene about? Why are they there? What is the plot point? How are they moving the thread of the plot from this chapter to this chapter to this chapter? I started getting a better sense of it, a much better sense of it. And so I went back and tried it and it, that time it worked. So just to get the timeline straight, there's the the novella, um, mm -hmm. and then the the group that you met through John Conley, that was during the writing of the first uh, full length novel that got Correct. rejected. All right. So that was the you said the the agent some of the editors liked the novella, but you hadn't gone through the writing group process yet. So was there was that not yet completely in the the right form? Or it sounds like you kind of already had that figured out by the time you wrote the novella. It, it was already passing the muster of this is professional writing in this genre. I don't think it was. Okay. I don't think it was. I think, you know, A, I, I'm, I'm completely ripping off my, my mask of newbie, right? Oh. Sending it directly to these editors yep. that they even respond. I mean, that, that I, you know, I would go to the mailbox every day waiting for that self-addressed stamped envelope to come back. It was so, so incredibly exciting. And then they would come back and they would say, hey, this is good, but, you know, keep trying, keep, keep working on it. Um, I, of course, did submit that novella to John Sanford's editor, who is now a friend of mine, you yep. know, now all these years later. Um, and I, I told him about it and he was like, yeah, I don't even remember that. I'm like, oh, thank God, because I did it under a different name. I, I did do that under a different name. So, but, you know, when it was a full length novel, when it was, it was clearly a franchise character. Um, at the time, so this was 2005 okay. um, when, when all this was really happening. And my first book came out in 2007. So it, this was in 2005. I had joined a group blog called Murderati, where I wrote a weekly column every Friday. I was part of the, the guppies in the Sisters in Crime group. I was part of the critique group. I had just plugged in to this community and I was reading everything I'd get my hands on to yeah. see how I could become a better writer. And I got a lot of encouragement from a lot of people early on. And, you know, I probably would have quit if I hadn't had that community. I would have listened to that, that critical voice sure. that started when I was 21 and, and I would have walked away. But everybody pushed me just to try a little bit harder and to be a little bit better. And it worked. So if the uh, so the first novel, uh, the first novel was re rejected, but mm -hmm. was good. And then the second one had a three book deal. If we Correct. did some sort of differential analysis, what's the key differences between novel manuscript number two and, and novel manuscript number one? Plot to okay. start with, it was the same characters. Um, it was uh, definitely plot. I, I elevated the plot. I elevated the number of characters and their side stories and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and I brought in a character later on into the, to introduce him into the series instead of starting with him. And that, that really just kind of helped it. It was the franchise character, Taylor Jackson, and it was a much darker 
book. So here's why that book didn't sell. This mm -hmm. is the God to honest truth. Okay. The ma the killer had a reason that was organic. And in the second book, he was just cruel. Yeah. It was just it was just genuine cruelty. The first one wasn't quite dark enough because there was a redemptive thread there because he didn't have control. He was doing things because of a, a physical reason. That was the huge difference. And that's what they wanted it dark. They wanted, especially in that moment, female authors who could write really dark stuff. And that was, that was what the market wanted. And that's what I gave them. <laughs> it was, I mean, it was really dark. I mean, the darkest of my books won an award. I'm like, I can't believe it. you guys are sick. <laughs> this is creepy. <laughs> it's genuinely a creepy story. What are you thinking? But you know, when you when you go there, when you're willing to go there, and that that was the difference. I went ahead and and went there. So then, what happened? Okay, so once you're in the door uh, mm -hmm. and you have your first deal, and I, I, from what I understand, multi book is pretty common for new writers um in genre fiction right if, if we're going to sign you we want to sign you for multiple books. especially if you're doing a series yes yeah okay right i mean this was like stephanie myers signed a three book deal with twilight which was you know the best seven hundred fifty thousand dollar deal probably that was you know ever signed in the uh history of publishing yeah, right. um so what's it like once you're once you're in the industry is it okay, now, as long as I keep doing this once a year, this is a sustainable career, or is it incredibly precarious? What's it like once your foot's in the door in uh, that type of thriller writing? <laughs> so the first thing, when my agent called to say that we had gotten an offer, the first thing he said is they want to know if you can write two books a year. Two a year? And two a year. Ooh. Two a year. And I said, of course I can. Now, I wasn't going to jeopardize this opportunity by saying no. So yeah, I can write two books a year. And I did. So I wrote two books a year for several years. That's that's why 2007 to 2022, I have my 25th book is getting ready to come out. So I've, I've done way more. I usually write three a year. Um, and it was it was not, I don't want to say it was easy, but because I was in one world one set of characters, a series, it's carrying on. It wasn't as difficult as if I was trying to write a standalone twice a year. Um, standalone being uh, something that doesn't have continuing characters. So, and that was that was the model. I mean, there were folks like Alison Brennan that they were, they would release three of her books at once. They would do one in January, one in February, one in March. Huh. They just got as much product out into the marketplace as they possibly could. And you built a readership really quickly. Um, and, and that was then the base of everything that they did after that. So what's the, that's interesting. I'm interested in this, in that model. I mean, so, so it's the, it's the model there, the more books, the more you can build a readership, but also it's the more you're monetizing each reader you already have. So if I become a fan of yours on your first book and you're publishing three a year, the publishing company is getting three book sales out of me every year is, is, is for sure. So, yeah. So is that the model? Like it actually more content in fiction, um, sque it, well, it maximizes the revenue. It's at some sort of optimal point. Right. Just so, so it's an upside down triangle. You know, you get this one little bit of, uh, readership out of your first book and then they follow you to the second book, but then there's a whole new readership that gets the second book. So they go book back and buy the first book. Then by the third book, same thing. You've got all of these, you know, first tier, second tier fans, and now the third tier are new to it, and they go back and do one and two. What's interesting is publishing has gotten away from this model. I mean, they just don't do this anymore. But even in fiction, office, even in genre, they're not even in genre. The traditional houses aren't doing that anymore. No, they have huh. slowed everybody down, and it's the indie authors who are doing the fast releases. Well, because yeah, they, interesting, interesting, because, mm -hmm. okay, well, I have two, two follow-ups. I mean, this, I want to get back to your story in a second, but this industry insider stuff is interesting to me. Uh, my first observation is very different in nonfiction. There's a, there's a, a different fear in nonfiction. There's, a, there's an audience fatigue. People will not follow a nonfiction 
author like they will a series in fiction. I mean, they'll follow in the sense that I'll read Malcolm Gladwell when his new book comes out because I like Malcolm mm-hmm. Gladwell. But if he publishes three books this year, that's too much Malcolm Gladwell. So there's a <laughs> weird like refractory period with nonfiction where sure. you can you can overstay your your readership. Like, ah, I've read something by you. Um, why do you, was, did the publishing houses pull back from that model? Was this a it's just the the capital flow or the you know the the expense? Is this a contracting industry? I'm trying to understand what their motivation might have been. Part of it was ebooks, which kind of put a a spike in the mass market paperback format. So you get, you know, the traditional, you you would come out with a a hardcover and then 11 months later, the mass market would come out in preparation for the next hardcover, right? That's the, that's the Grisham model, the, the one a year Grisham model. For those of us who were doing the fast release, I started in mass market. That Harlan Coben started in mass market. Laura Lipman started in mass market. Um, that was my plan all along, write 10 mass markets and then write a big hardcover standalone um, and make the jump into the big leagues, right? Interesting. But ebooks came along and really messed with that. They changed the entire structure of how publishing works. And so there really wasn't as much of a market for mass market. I mean, you can go to the grocery store now. Some of the grocery stores still have a book um, section, but most of them don't. Yeah. And and the the drug stores, you know, Walgreens used to have this huge wall of mass market. That's where I used to get my books. You know, I would go whatever to pick up a prescription at Walgreens and buy two or three of the thickest books I could find at the cheapest price point. Ebooks created a cheaper price point. Kindle mm-hmm. made it very attractive to read on a device thousands of books at your fingertips is an incredibly romantic idea. And it really kind of changed the trajectory for a lot of us that were doing that quick release. And was it, it was changing the discovery mechanism. So in a pre ebook mass market world, you would go to a books, you would go to a place where you were seeing books. And so there was physical discovery. Ebooks changed that model as digital discovery, mm-hmm. and now people are being driven to books through other forces, not just seeing it. So it's much harder to have an author be discovered. Was that part of the dynamic going on? Sure, sure. And we had the you know the the attrition of the review space too. Yeah, that that truly was damaging. And and you know we we go from the indies to the big box stores. And then the ebooks come along and then Amazon figures out how to capitalize on that. The big stock, big box stores start going away. Borders closing. Wow, that borders closing really hit a lot of us in the the genre world hard. That really, um, it, it just cut everybody's sales in half yeah. immediately. And and so that's, you know, the the music industry went through the same sort of changes as the publishing industry has. Um, but it's it seems to have recovered a bit. Um, the trade paperback is is really popular format for a lot of genres. You know the new Colleen Hoover that came out that sold eight hundred and ten thousand copies first week. <laughs> Go Colleen, trade paperback. It's a lower price point. It's people love them. It's so they it, it's it the industry has been in flux since I've been in it. It has changed dramatically month to month, year to year since I started. So if, to keep up. So if we go back to, let's say, like 2007, 2008, it's pretty early in, into your career as, like a full, as a full-time novelist, what's your, mm-hmm. life, what's your life like back then, like day to day? Day to day. So I signed my first deal just in time to attend the very first International Thriller Writers Conference that was out in um, Arizona as a writer, that I got the badge that had writer on it. And that was, you know, the most incredible moment. (laughs) I mean, talk about suddenly feeling like you belong, right? It's the secret handshake. Now you're an author, now you're there as a peer to the people that you love. And I met all of the people that I read. I, I, I went up to Tess Gerritsen and I was completely tongue tied. And I said, Tess, you're my biggest fan. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> just really embarrassing, embarrassing stuff. Um, I always have been a little bit of a puppy when it comes to all of this. I get really excited. But I met Lee Child and Lee Child and I hit it off. And, and we had a small group of, of writers um, called Killer Year. 
a small collective. This is where we're going to get into the Crichton stuff later. So remind me of this. I shall. A small collective of, of mass market writers who we knew we weren't going to get the kind of attention that the hardcover debuts were going to get. So we banded together in a marketing organization, called ourselves Killer Year, went into that ITW, that, that conference, with t-shirts, bags, mm. just all the swag, and got the attention of the industry. And the International Thriller Writers Board said, you know what, this is a really cool idea. Can we adopt you? We're like, yes, you can. So we became the debut authors of the International Thriller Writers. They now have an annual program for debuts that is based on the killer year model that they bring in all the new writers. They get to go to the conference. They get to stand up at a breakfast and introduce their books and introduce themselves to the industry. It was really a magical thing and it changed how the publishers do marketing. We suddenly started seeing, oh, hey, we can put authors from different houses together yeah. and market them in one way. Um, it was really cool. It was a really cool thing. So I'm, I'm in, I was involved and I was one of the founders of, of the killer year. Um, I was blogging at Murderati. I mean, I was going hard and fast, writing two books a year, yeah. you know, just making up for lost time. I was making up for lost time for sure. And were you doing at this point, uh, I've heard you say four hour, like four mm -hmm. hours a day. So w w was there a strict? One to four, one thousand to four. words a day, one to four in the afternoon. It's just sacred time, sacred space. Um, that and, and this was just before Facebook came and ruined all of our lives. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I mean, it's, I've met, I've gotten a lot of really great friends through social media and sure. a lot of phenomenal readers and, and it's a wonderful, wonderful tool. But you're, you're in a safe that... space. You're in a safe space to, to, to uh, <laughs> yeah. ding social media here. You don't have to worry about that. <laughs> Zuckerberg is not listening <laughs> to my very, show. <laughs> you, you know this. You know I, I have a love-hate relationship with social media. I, I hate that we have to do it. I love the people that I know there. The um, Facebook came along right as I was getting my first book out. So I was the last book in Killer Year of 2007. Mine came out in November. I was the last one. Mm -hmm. Everybody else was already out. And S Facebook had come along 2006 as we were starting to market everything. So we put all of our effort there and started growing these huge followings on Facebook. And that's Part of our marketing plan was how we were going to get the books out. Um, it was, I saw early on how detrimental it was to my mental health, how detrimental it was to my creative life. Um, and, and that's when I instituted, okay, no matter what, every day, one o'clock, everything gets turned off and I write from one to four. And yeah. that's the only way I was able to keep up with everything that I was doing. I did business in the morning and creative in the afternoon. And so at a one to four every afternoon, uh, how long, so that would take how long to finish a novel? You could, if you're doing two a year, I guess the answer is four or five months. Four months. Four months. Yeah. Okay. It was a, it was a month of, of research because what I was doing is very research heavy at the time. I was having to go out with, you know, ride alongs with the cops and medical examiners and all that fun stuff. FBI agents. It's cool. Uh, so a month of research and kind of thinking about what I was going to do, what the story was, four months of writing, a month of editing. And the the research, like you would do this in the one to four as well. Everything's within. Mm. Yeah. No, that was that was usually in the morning okay. because I was also writing one book, editing one book and promoting one book all at the same time. I so always had three books in in various stages of what was happening. I see. So when you say business in the morning, that that includes researching the next book and publicity activities for the last book. So you're you're you're, you're you're gathering. What about outlining, figuring out the plot? Is is that something you would do as part of your one to four time in the immediate lead up to writing for a book, or is that also happening in, in the morning or outside? It's uh, so I'm a pantser. I, I am very, very loose with my outlines. I outline a little bit more now that I'm doing standalones, but back then it was, it was just go sit down, read what I wrote the day before, right. edit that. So it was just that little small loop back to refresh my memory of, okay, here's where I was yesterday and then plow through. 
And, you know, I could do, I mean, I could do a thousand words in an hour if I want to. If I'm really, really focused, I get in that flow and it's like, okay, the words are just flying out of me, which is the best state to be in. It's, you know, I always love those days because you end up somewhere where you didn't know you were going to go. Yep. <laughs> it's really fun. But the, you know, so it would take probably an hour to do the, you know, edit what, what was there. Look at, you know, sometimes I'd go back two chapters. I used to write very linear stories. So it yep. was really easy to, okay, this is what happens next, 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 next. Um, as I've, I've matured into my creativity, I don't do that anymore. I write what I feel like writing that day. Um, it keeps it a little more exciting. They're usually multi points of view and many, many, you know, going back and forth in time and stuff. So that it's a lot easier not to go in a linear fashion when you're doing it that way. But you're but saying, yeah. yeah, but you're saying it might be, you might spend up to the first hour sometimes, uh, editing what you wrote the day before mm -hmm. that's yep, when you just, yeah, okay and that's when you tighten it up or say uh maybe even i don't like the way this is in retrospect this has pushed me in a direction that is going to be hard to get back from so let's roll it back it, it could be pretty drastic i assume on some days oh it can be because then it's, you know you're like okay and nothing happens <laughs> i'm ready to go <laughs> nothing happens it's like all right you've gotten you've gotten off track so you have to go back and figure out where you got off the train right. tracks. So, so what do you have to figure out in advance for, for this genre? Do you have to figure out there's like a, the, the ending, the twist, the, you know, is there a skeleton you have to figure out? In, like, here's the, where it's going to be set. Here's the twist. Here's the five beats. Like how much has to be figured out before you say, I, I can start writing. For me, I have a tendency to just start writing. Um, and then figure it out later <laughs> because I just, I like to kind of immerse into the story. So I'll probably get 10,000 words down. I'll usually know who the character is going to be. Um, I'll, I'll know who I won't know who the killer is or, or who the villain is, you know, as, as I've, I've gotten away from those kinds of, of, of books, I'm, I'm, I'm doing something different now. So I don't normally know who did it unless it is a serial killer and it's from their point of view, right? Th then I know who did it, but I often don't know how. Um, I don't know necessarily why I'm discovering that as I go. That's the fun part of it for me. Um, I know it probably gives a lot of people hives, the idea of just let it happen. But I was going so fast and I was so, in, in my defense, I was so immersed in the world of these characters and in their lives and all of the things that were happening that it wasn't very hard to just slip into their shoes and okay, it's that kind of writing is very reactive. You have, right. uh, especially cops, you know, co any, any sort of law enforcement, they're trying to prevent something bad from happening again something bad happens, they come in and try to stop it from happening again. Yeah. That's not rocket science formula to, to sit down and work out on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Yeah. Well, so when you're, when you're doing the, the research, where you're spending time with FBI agents, medical examiners, the Nashville police, is that all just about picking up tools for the toolkit, like lingo, things that happen, mm -hmm. things people do, equipment. It, it, this is just filling the filling the toolbox so that when you're then writing, you can say things right. Or you're like, oh, I, let's use a whatever, so the such and such tool that the coroner uses the cut open skulls. I know what that's called. Why don't we put that in there? So it's, you're not <laughs> you're not researching. I'm writing a book where the serial killer is a circus clown and I need to understand, you know, uh, how the circus works or something. It's more just all right now, this particular lead is part of the Nashville police force. Let's just understand that world. I'll draw from that later. So character is king in genre fiction. Yes, you have to have a propulsive plot, but the characters are what keep people coming back to a series, right? They fall in love with the character. They want to see what they do. And in order to develop good characters, I had to become intimately familiar with how the police force worked. I had to become familiar with how a medical examiner, you, you know, you really, you're right. It's the toolkit, it's the lingo, but it's also their, how they react 
to certain situations. I mean, uh, cops have a tendency, you know, they've got gallows humor. They have a tendency to either um, get really religious or become alcoholics because what they see on a day-to-day -day basis is horrific. Yep. And I mean, just the, the things I saw on the few ride-alongs, I did eight ride-alongs, just the things that I saw there, um, the first the first overnight ride along, you know, I went into it again, puppy, very excited. This is amazing. It's going to be so cool. And the very first thing we did was roll up onto a stabbing. And the man who, who had been stabbed, bled out in front of us, mm. died. Um, his friend that had stabbed him, they caught him, put him in the back of the car. They've got the, the murder weapon. We went you know, here he is, this man just murdered somebody and he's sitting behind me in a car and we drive to the courthouse and they book him. And, you know, I got to see literally from, from start to finish. And I, I went home at six in the morning and I sat down on the couch and I looked down and I had his blood on my huh. boots. Yeah. And it got real for me. It wasn't, oh, this is really cool. I'm writing about cops. It became a very intense experience and everything that I did from that moment on, I wanted to make sure that I had it right. And that if a cop picked up one of my books and read it, yep. they would say, this is our life. Yeah. So it, it did become um, a little less flip for me as, as I started doing that work. I mean, just as a technical question to even set up a ride along like that is the, the key is, I've published a book or I have a deal to write a book with publisher X. That's, that's basically the stakes to asking a, a police department. Well, again, not exactly how I, I called, <laughs> I called down to um, Metro Nashville to the homicide office and you know, I've got a hook, right? Has there ever been a serial killer in Nashville? And the guy that answered, he was like, why do you want to know that? I'm like, yeah, oh, can, well, can we get your book. name and phone number because yeah, you're like, starting are, to disturb you, us. Are you yeah. auditioning for this role? <laughs> you yeah. know, why? So he immediately, he's like, why don't you come in? Why don't you come in and have a conversation with me? Well, turns out he, he was a writer as well or wanted yeah. to be a writer. Interesting. And, and so he saw an opportunity to learn from me just as I saw an opportunity to learn from him. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, I've made some really fun mistakes along the way doing the research, like, you know, calling up the the security at Radnor Lake, which is a, a pretty, real pretty lake here in town and say, hey, I dropped a body in your lake. Can you tell me if what you would do? And they're just like, excuse me? I'm like, no, 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 time out, time out. I'm a writer. It's not real. You know, it, it's, it is kind of amusing. Just we get very caught up in what we're doing as writers and the worlds that we're creating. And it's sometimes uh, good to remember that other people don't have the same sensibilities. We're all a little odd. We're a little odd for sure. Yeah, it, we, I'll, I'll accept that. Yes, <laughs> writers, us, us writers are all- Writers in general, just a little odd. All we're, all a little, we're all a little odd. We'll get back to our interview with J.T. Ellison in just a moment. But first, I wanted to briefly mention another sponsor that makes this show possible, and that is Policy Genius. You know you need life insurance. You hope you never have to use it, but you know you need it. If you don't have it, the reason is probably it is unclear how to even get started. I mean, do you call an insurance agent? Is there some sort of building you go to? It's just one of these things in life where uh, it's something that adults do, but you don't really know how they actually do it. This is where Policy Genius enters the scene. It makes it as easy as a couple clicks to get life insurance. So Policy Genius was uh, built to modernize the life insurance industry. Their technology makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from top companies like AIG and Prudential in just a few clicks. With Policy Genius, you can find the life insurance policies to start at just $17 a month for $500,000 of coverage. You just go to the website, you give them their information, they give you quotes. If you like what you see, you click and you rock and roll. That's how easy it is. Now keep in mind, this is a marketplace, so they're not incentivized to recommend one insurer over another. They have no added fees. They keep your personal info private. They have 
thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. A lot of people have used Policy Genius to get life insurance easily. So your loved ones deserve a financial safety net and you deserve a smarter way to find and buy it. So head to policygenius.com or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com. I also want to talk about stamps.com. This is that season, that holiday season where there's so much shipping that has to happen. Gifts here and there, fruitcakes for some reason to your aunt in Milwaukee, whatever it is. A lot of, a lot of sending of things at uh, the holiday season. We dread that because it means a lot of getting through traffic, parking, and waiting in those long, long lines at the post office. This is why you need stamps.com so you can avoid all of that mess. You can sign up now and you'll be printing your own postage in just minutes. Stamps.com is your one-stop shop for all of your shipping and mailing needs. For more than 20 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses. They give you access to all the postal service and UPS services you need to run your business right from your computer. No lines, no traffic, no hassle. Even save money with major discounts on USPS and UPS shipping, getting up to 86% off. All you need is a computer and a printer. You weigh the package. You print your postage. Stick it on the box, schedule a pickup, done. No post office visit required. So this holiday season, trade late nights for silent nights and get started with stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code DEEP for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page and enter the code DEEP. All right, now with that, let's get back to our interview with JT. Um, so what's the economics, or at least then, and we can talk about how that's different now, but what were the economics of being a, a two or three time a year mass market original thriller writer, like in that first decade of the 2000s? Is that a, I can, you can make a stable living off of it? Is it precarious? Is it winner take all? Like, what's that industry like, or what was it like? It, it is, I mean, the faster you go, the more you get paid, right? So that was also driving me like, okay, you know, the, the I, I get paid, they break your contract um, at that level, they break your contract into three payments, mm -hmm. you get paid for all three books as an advance at once. So, hey, great, we get a nice little chunk of change. Then you get paid on turning an outline and then you get paid when you turn in the book. Um, the higher advances, they break them into fourths, the even higher fifths, sometimes sixth. It just depends. You know, you get paid on hardcover release and mass market release. And it just, it, you've, you've seen publishers marketplace and the, the, so I, I, I got a, uh, was it a very nice deal for my, my first, I mean, I, I, had, again, great agent lucked out, got a, a decent chunk of change to start. Um, more than a lot of my peers, which was phenomenal. And I wrote really fast and I, I met my deadlines and that made them want to buy more books. So I had all three books done before my first book came out and a new deal before my first book came out. So I had six books under contract before my first book came out. That wasn't necessarily like everybody else. That was a little unique. But that, I mean, that's interesting aside, by the way, that the, the, Publishers Marketplace code words. And for the, the listeners who don't know, there's the Publisher Market, they announce deals and they have this terminology. Yeah, yeah, good deal, nice deal, very good deal. Um, yeah. But it, it sounds like actually a, a someone who's writing in a genre, those deals mean a very different thing than for a nonfiction writer. Because if a nonfiction writer gets a very nice deal, that might be spread, you know, that might be their money for two yeah. years or two and a half years. If you can get that all in, in one year. Um, and then, so what, what's the key? You said dead, you make, make your deadlines. What else goes into continuing to get new contracts? So if you want to stay as a full-time uh, writer in the genre, is it they're just happy as long as you're reliable to keep putting books in the pipeline? Is it sales numbers based? Is it will keep you as a writer, but we're going to adjust those advances up and down every time based on the last numbers we have? What's that reality? It's all about the readers. Okay. If you don't connect with the readers, you don't get another deal because you don't sell books and you got to sell books. 
I mean, that's just, it's just, that's the bottom line. You have to be able to, you know, turn a, a little bit of a profit for the publisher. And that means building a readership. And that means outreach into the community, doing, you know, touring, all of the, all of that kind of stuff. But yeah, I mean, the readers are, are king, right? If you aren't getting a readership, your career is going to fail. And, and that's very difficult. There are people though that got a readership and their careers failed anyway. You it, it just, it's, there's some sort of alchemical process that, that happens. And I don't know what it is. And I don't know why some careers work and some don't. Yeah. Um, I think mine worked because I was rather relentless about it. Um, I just kept shoving editorial in front of them that was good. It was getting good reviews and the readership liked it. Um, I wasn't going to take no for an answer. <laughs> you know, I had already, I had already been deterred once. I wasn't going to be deterred again. Um, but I, that also meant I did a lot of work that wasn't creative work. Yeah. I did a lot of, can, can, you know, going out on tour, going to conferences, building relationships, one of the most important things is supporting other authors in the genre and sharing their work with with your people and say you know hey if you like my stuff you're gonna love allison brennan and lisa unger and mary kubica you got to read them too yeah and and that you know we all did that for each other and the rising tide lifted all boats so what back then what worked for building an audience what did you do in your first five years facebook Facebook, so how, like, man, I got how, to find... What does that mean, though? How do you build, like, in 2008, how do you build a Facebook group? Like, how do you get new people there? You post funny things that people liked, and you commented on other people's posts. We had the blog. We had that Murderati blog. Yep. Um, I was also writing short stories that was were getting placed um, all over in all of the, the magazines and all of the online... Um, uh, magazines, the zines that were, that were going on. Um, I, I was hustling. I, I hustled, right? I didn't, I didn't sit back and just write the next book because at that time, the people that were just sitting back and writing the next book weren't being rewarded. They were getting dropped because, you know, of, of the 13 that started in killer year, only one or two of us is actually still traditionally published most are indie and several just don't have a career at all. They're, they're gone. They disappear. So, and that's, so you're big on, that is real. So you're, you were big on Facebook. Um, mm -hmm. you're doing short stories and, Twitter. and tw then Twitter. Okay. And you think this all was, and then were you capturing, do you, and we've talked about this before offline, but you, you, you're capturing readers at all, like in a new email newsletter. newsletter. Or, yeah. Newsletter just, and, and the, I've always, because it's the only thing I owned, my blog and my newsletter were the only things I owned, and I recognized that early on because you know I got to five thousand on on Facebook, and what are you going to do after that? You can't have any more friends, no more people. Yeah. Then they made the author pages. Oh, okay. So we moved everybody over to an author page, and it grows from there. Um, but yeah, the newsletter has always been. I would literally show up at a signing with a notebook out in front of my books and say, "Sign up for my newsletter." And, and that, that worked. I mean, I've, I've got a pretty robust newsletter list and I send out a monthly, still, I send out a monthly newsletter and that's, that is the main focus of everything that I do. Is that the core right now of what, uh, do you see everything else as, uh, in terms of channels, as bringing people to the newsletter and the newsletter is the core thing that's going to alert your existing audience, there's a new book to keep them interested, to keep them buying? That's what I try to do. Yes. Try to do, okay. That that is what I try to do. Um it is it is especially around release. The publishers really do depend on us to as as you've very eloquently put it rent out our audiences to them for free. <laughs> um which drives me crazy because uh I'm in a I'm in a I've got so many books that are being downpriced that I've got a sale going every week. And, you know, the publisher wants me to be out there saying, hey, this book's for sale. And it turns into buy my book, buy my book, buy my book. You know, and that's just not what I'm about. I'm I'm about sharing my work with people. And, you know, hey, if they get a deal on the site, cool. 
but I'm, I'm much more interested in the, the discourse between myself and the reader. And that's something we've talked about that I, I have a difficult time stepping away entirely from some of these places because there is a, an age breakdown. The yeah. older readers who are my core loyalist from Taylor Jackson days are still Facebook people. And I can't, I mean, they, they get my newsletter, but I can't migrate them to a blog. The Instagram people are my new, that's my new audience with my standalones that are more domestic suspense than the, the psychological thriller. Yeah. So I'm writing, I'm, I'm appealing to different audiences in different places, but the one constant is that newsletter. And it, so is Instagram more slice of lifey than Facebook? Is it, it changes the type of content you're putting out about yourself? Yeah. And that's, I'm not comfortable with it. I'm, I'm yeah. actually a really private person and Instagram, you know, yeah, there's a lot of pictures of my cats. <laughs> that seems to be the cat posts do really, really well. And, you know, the performative part of it is just, I'm just not, I'm just not really good at that. That's, I'm not comfortable with that. Um, I've got people that help me with it. Um, right now, actually, because Instagram has switched over away from pretty pictures to reels to compete with TikTok, I hired a film student to do my reels for me. She's brilliant. She sends me a script and, you know, I want you to do this. So, you know, I'm over here doing the Vanna White thing. Yeah. Is then... that, is that going to sell books? It's not going to sell my books. I can't sell my own books dancing on TikTok. Right. right. I mean, that's the, always been my, my feeling about this. I can sell somebody else's book though. And that is important to me to be a good literary citizen and share other people's work with my readers and maybe, you know, help them find an audience. A lot of people reached down the ladder and, and held out a hand and pulled me up my debut year. And I try very hard to do the same for them. Yeah, and we've talked about that offline before too. That it, it seems to be true with a couple notable exceptions in writing. Social media is very good in terms of book sales in ter for its ability to have other people talk about your book. Mm -hmm. um, but it's only so effective in directly selling your book to someone. This seems right. to be some sort of reality of it. It's, it's like a great tool for people to discover stuff. And so like social media has probably sold a lot of my books, even though I don't use social media. But when people are direct appealing to their followers somehow it's effective but not super effective you know most people are like well you know of course you're gonna but then you and i say things like this and then we're confident about it and then uh colleen hoover comes around and shows how like wait a second if actually i'm saying that wrong what's her i'm getting her name no wrong. no no you're right colleen, yeah, colleen hoover. hoover colleen hoover uh, a bunch of my readers sent me colleen hoover stuff and i went down a rabbit hole recently where it, as far as I understand, among other things, she like perfectly hit this like book TikTok movement that was starting and was, I mean, it was, everything was aligning and then it, it, and it exploded. So now the rest of us are going to be cursed for the next decade. <laughs> like you'd be on TikTok because it, sometimes that does happen. And I think there was like Twitter early on, there were some authors that that was a big thing. Facebook, you know, a, a couple authors were just right. I have an author friend in a writing group with mine who did really well with um, Instagram early on. And so like when she writes a book, it just, and she's a nonfiction writer, but was early to uh, mom Instagram and it, you know, whatever. But it's not a replicatable playbook it's hard to come back in later and say oh i will now do i'll do colleen hoover it's like no you missed that yeah you missed that and and now everybody literally is chasing it i mean i literally uh, well I, we won't go there but i i'll tell you about that offline okay i'm excited what about that few seconds before we went live i will tell you what happened oh okay i, I can uh, imagine I, 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 mm. Yeah, I'll tell you offline because <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen with it. But, you know, it's interesting. The uh, We see this every 10 years, too. The the young uh, audience, the the new readers who have matured into the, the out of YA novels and into adult fiction. There's always, you know, we had E.L. James and Fifty Shades Grey. Yeah. And Colleen is hitting that mark and adding in the real life struggles with domestic abuse and all of that. And, and you know, she's just 
she's hitting a market, but these books are not new. That's the fascinating things. The, the book that came out is new and it's a prequel or prequel or sequel to this big book that blew up on TikTok. But her books have been out for years and they're just getting this backlist bump, as we call it, with your books that are out there that people don't know anything about. Again, that inverted yeah. funnel of the new reader realizes, oh my gosh, you've got 15 other books. I'm going to go buy all of them. Um, yeah, she, she's she been out there and a lot of people didn't give her any respect for a really long time. And I love seeing that vindication that you know, she may not have been, again, good enough to be published, quote unquote, as some people like to say, yeah. but her work resonates with people in a way that uh, you, you can't deny 800,000 units first week is connecting with yeah. a large market. Yeah, you can't, you can't uh, trend your way to that. You can't market your way to that. 800,000 mm -hmm. in a week is you're touching like a very legitimate cord inside of uh, readership. Yeah, for yep. sure. Yeah, you can get away with a twenty thousand because of a, you know, a marketing trend. Um, <laughs> so you I, know, but before we move from that though, it's something yeah. I wanted to mention is the the difference between fiction writers on social media and the non-fiction writers on social media. I heard you were talking a couple of weeks ago um, with with Ryan at the Daily Stoic. Um, why is his last name going out of my head? Holiday. Sorry. Thank you. Um, and you guys were talking about how social media can be used for nonfiction because you've got something that's going to change somebody's life. You've got something that's going to change their world. And they're there looking for that. Fiction is different. It is purely performative because, I mean, we're going to give them a book every year, every six months, whatever our schedule is. Um, and in between that time, we have to stay connected with them. Yeah. And that's that old school model of, you know, you only your first week sales dic dictate everything. You only have that first week to make an impact. That's the other thing that the ebooks did that kind of killed a lot of the industry is suddenly your backlist is available all the time. It's it doesn't matter if those books went out of print 10 years ago, they're there digitally. And print on demand changed all of that too. So it it is there is a very big difference between the nonfiction social media and the fiction social media. I think yours is more important than than ours. Or, or at least it's more important for, yeah, but not always the author themselves, but it's like, it's vital to books going big is people recommending in a way, mm -hmm. because in nonfiction, there's this recommendation culture of, this book really changed my life, you should read it. Like, it, it makes sense to recommend. So like the more channels that exist for people to talk about your book, this sure. is the this is like the James Clear Atomic Habits, you know, example. Um, that book sold three or four million copies in its first years, not because James his audience was that big and he could reach them directly, but it was touching some chord people were having and it spread right. really fast on social media, not him talking. It was people like, You gotta read this book and, and I call it the the sister test. If my sister has heard of a book, then I know it's a nonfiction book, then I know it's picked up steam. So when she made <laughs> Atomic Habits, I said, okay, that is picked up. Uh, that is picked up a lot of uh, category crossing steam. Um, so I wanted to talk briefly about advice. I'm, I'm thinking through now someone who wants to, to get into this type of writing. So I have like a, a few questions here. So one is just, what is the reality of changing to this less books per year model? Is this less financially viable as a career or as the, the market adjusted somehow, even though you're publishing less books, that you can still make a living if you're starting today? Um, it, it all depends on that advance, right? So, so the very first bit of advice is write the book they can't ignore, right? Write the book that it's not going to be a derivative of what Colleen Hoover is doing. Write that book that you are passionate about that you absolutely, you know, is unique. You've studied the market. You read everybody in your genre. You have an idea of what the market wants. This is what the indie authors are doing very interestingly. They, they go in, they deep dive. They know exactly what the niche market will bear. They know what the tropes are that they need to hit in that story and they hit them and they sell hundreds of thousands of copies. Um, if you're gonna go on a traditional route, you need a book that is going to blow their socks off. They're not buying a lot right now. 
Um, it seems like they are, but it does feel like they've pulled back quite a bit on um, how much they're buying and how much they're buying it for. So that big advance, you know, I've got several friends who are, you know, major authors um, who are getting millions in advances and, and they say, get all the money up front, <laughs> get as much as you can. You're never going to earn out for yeah. somebody like me. I'm not getting that big. Of, I'm getting decent advances. I, you know, I'm certainly making a living at it. Um, but I've also earned out all of my contracts. So I'm getting royalties on top of advances and you can have a pretty decent living off the royalties as well if you're selling enough books. So, so interesting. So it's, it's the market. Can, it seems like before there was more of a division, there was the multiple times a year genre writers. And then there was the, um, the once a year writers where it wasn't series. So there was the Grishams and the Crichtons where hey, different characters every time, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and those were bigger, they're like hardcover releases once a year and it's Huge. more falling. So is the, is the industry kind of contract, it's contracting and saying we're, we're basically just shifting towards more people who can make a go at the Crichton Grisham model of um, the blockbuster model. You have a chance of it being massive and because we need 1% to be massive. And so that's what they're looking for now. Right. And John is usually, John Grisham is usually the, the 1% massive. So his book came out this week. And he moved 90, what, 91,000 units um, and hardcover in the first week. That's a decent first week, right? That's a tent pole. That's, and that's, that's kind of what happened. When I was coming up, every, there was a, a number one bestseller for each of these little niche genres. Right. And then everything, you know, went, horse, went vertical. And right. it was only the same 10 people that if you go back and look at the list in 1970, 1980, 1990, 2000, 2010, same names, the Stephen Kings, the Danielle Steele, Nora Roberts, you know, these huge franchise authors are, are holding up the industry um, with unbelievable sales. And they are paving the way for the rest of us to be able to have careers because they're making enough that they can, the publishers can then take a chance on somebody new. Would you recommend at the, like 2022, not starting with a, a, a series with a, like a lead, a detective series, and instead trying to do like the big concept Crichton thriller? That's, you know, I feel like the market has moved away from series. Um, I have a series title that I have finished that I'm not publishing right now because, you know, the, the market wants standalones. Um, my publisher has moved me to standalones because that's what the market, it's, when I say the market wants it, it's much easier for the sales team to go in and say, I've got a brand new JT Ellison novel. It's called It's One of Us. It's about infertility and this crazy DNA story. And it's nothing like anything you've ever seen. And they'll go, okay, cool. I want to buy a ton of copies for my store versus going in and saying, hey, JT has the ninth book in her series and you know it's got a huge readership and everything, but the odds of us getting new readers on the bandwagon aren't as big. Right. The standalones just reach more people and the sales team have a much easier path to, to selling it into the stores. Uh, so that's okay, so if we're, we're advising the, the and, and my, the, the hypothetical person I have here in mind that we're advising is it's not, uh, not the, the kid coming out of college. I think it's, it's you in 2005, the equivalent of mm -hmm. I'm, I'm 10 years into a job. I'm, you know, uh, it's Clive Cussler when he was still working at the ad agency and, and thinking he was going to write thrillers. So there's like a, a shift going to happen. And okay. So our first loose piece of advice is this is not the time to, to be the next Michael Conley or Lee child. You might want to come in and have a uh, standalone. Second piece of advice yep. is knock your socks up. So what, what elements could knock their socks off? Is it uh, something like plot that hits you in the face, a uh, new type of character or setting? Is it style? What are the elements you have um, you might control that you, you're trying to get that huge effect out of for the agent who reads it or the editor who reads it? I think the best way, again, I'm big on researching the market, right? I think that's always incredibly important. I would spend a little bit of time on Netflix and HBO Max and all the other streaming services and look at what books are getting picked up. 
because those have a universality to them. And that is something that you absolutely need right now. You need a, a diverse cast. You need ABCD storylines. You need characters who are actually um, connecting. And it can't just be that, that main character. You need other characters that people can latch onto and feel comfortable with or feel uncomfortable with. Um, I think it's that's a really great place to see what is is kind of trending right now. There's, I mean, my gosh, they bought every single psychological domestic suspense out there trying to recreate Big Little Lies, Leon yep. Moriarty, right? And um, I can't think of any that have been made. <laughs> that they that they bought, but that was zeitgeisty, and everybody loved it, and and that's what they did. You have to have a story that's going to connect with people, and that you do through characters. I mean, it is absolutely the the plot needs to be great. Um, I think we've conditioned the readers for a twist, so I sometimes pull back away from doing something like that, specifically mm -hmm. because you know when people zig, I like to zag. And, you know, if you're coming up right now and you're, you know, you've got a job, you want to write a book, Nano, not Nano Rimo just started. So you're going to be, you know, laying down those 1600 words a day, trying to, to put a draft together. Um, it needs to be something that they haven't seen before. And they've seen everything. There's only seven plots. Every story is derivative. Yeah. So how do you take that and make it into something spectacular? And, and that's what you have to do. You have to level up from everything that you're reading, everything that you you think you know about this, then put it on steroids and take it and turn it up to 11. Right. So you have to have you have to be able to identify this is the element that I'm I'm leveling up on. And mm -hmm. I, I'm just putting this as a test against the famous, you know, one uh, big name authors of the last 40 years. And that actually kind of flies every time. Stephen King, I mean, he really upped the 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 violence of horror i mean those early i can't King read them are, yeah oh, I, I, mean, can, if, I can't even read them they freak me out too bad yeah yeah i mean if, if you thought the movie it like freaked you out go read that book i mean it gets weird <laughs> i mean it gets dark so he but he ramped that up um i'm thinking Crichton real early on was let's have uh computer printouts and talk about the specific you know mm -hmm. uh the specific scanning electron microscope stats in the adronomous street so he got really technical uh clancy did the same thing right clancy mm -hmm. was like let's get let's just get obsessive about the propulsion system on the submarines grisham brought in this sort of uh hyper reality of the legal practice Maybe. yeah like to Toro had kind of brought in you know hey legal thrillers and there's something cool in court cases and grisham is like this is what the hour you know if you're you're uh the new um associate at a law firm these are the mechanics of your life and the job interviews and how many hours you're billing uh so everyone kind of you're right there's a level up andy weir brought in this new yeah. new type of hard sci-fi like contemporary hard sci-fi like super hard sci-fi but not me explaining this future technology in the foundation series Asimov, like this is set three years in the future and let me really get into the physics or whatever. Like everyone's doing, so I, anyways, you're, uh, everything's passing your test basically. So what are you leveling up? What are you, what are you pushing? What are you pushing to a new place? What, what can people describe of like, oh, like a, you know, a, a Cal Newport book has blah, like it's, there's a thing. Okay, that's, that's good advice. That's, that's part of it. And the other is they're not precious about them. I mean, every single author you just named, what do they have in common? They get up, they get their coffee, they get in front of their computer, they write their words, they bang out the story, they turn it in, and then they turn around and do it again. Yep. You know, they're not so married to this is the book. This is the book that's going to change my life. This is the book that's going to change the industry. You know, you can't think like that. You have to think of, you know, I have, I bring something really unique to this story. You know, I'm, I'm going to retell David and Goliath, but I have something unique that David has that Goliath has never seen before. And that's the story I'm going to tell. That's what gets people noticed. Yeah. And then, okay, this is great. Um, maybe this is the hardest piece of all of this. What's the, what's the most efficient slash effective route from, I have no formal writing training, I'm just a reader, to uh, 
I going to be able to write something when I supercharge the, some element and level up? But I'm going to be able to write, actually deliver, craft something that could, could be sold and, and seems good. What's the route from A to B for the, for the, uh, uh, the yeah. Read everything right. you everything. can get your hands on, familiarize yourself with the market, institute a writing habit that you're sitting down every day writing the book. You can't sell a fiction novel on, uh, on proposal like you do with nonfiction. Nonfiction, yeah. you come up with a grand idea, you pitch it, they like to shape it into, you know, okay, this is what we're gonna do. Fiction, you've gotta finish the book. So you gotta finish the book. You, um, a lot of people go ahead and hire editorial, um, especially when they're starting out. So I would not discourage that because- What, what does getting, that mean? That means having somebody other than your mom read the book. You pay them by the hour to you like an editor. The hour by the okay. word, usually by the word. Um, yep. you can, you can get anywhere from, you know, 200, 400, 600 uh, on up. Um, you join the organizations and get a critique group, get a critique partner, get somebody who will tell you the truth about it. They will say, Hey, this is, this is a brilliant idea, but you aren't at the level to write it yet. You need to read Stephen King's on writing which is probably where everybody should start. You should read yep. Stephen King's on writing. And if that book speaks to you, if you, because it whispers a secret language, right? In between those lines. And, and if you hear that and, and it speaks to you, then okay, you're probably a writer. Go get Elizabeth George's right away. That's gonna teach you how to build characters. That's gonna teach you how to uh, develop a plot and, and just some of those very basic parts of building a novel. Um, that you have to learn. You know, oh, I've done oh, it so many times now. I've I even go back to these books and re Elizabeth and George's. Them. What which what what book is that? Right away. Elizabeth George's Right Away. Right away. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now that's more nitty gritty. Uh, here's how you make characters. Okay. Yeah. Because you need the best story you can possibly tell, um, in the best format you possibly can tell it. You know, so you've you know, say you are going to write an Andy Weir esque kind of story, um, or you're going to go Ernest Cline, Ready Player One. You you need to have something wildly unique in that spot that they haven't seen fifty thousand times before. How would you sequence the the these three things? So would you let's say Stephen King, um, if that speaks to you, then Elizabeth George. Would you then? Do edit paid editorial, and would you do that on what? Like, let me see if I can get three chapters and work with this person until I learn. Like, I get three chapters to something that that person says, okay, that's good, and then you go to the critique group, or do you start with the critique group? I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to build out here a, a really mechanical um, timeline or sequence. <laughs> But it's art, Cal. It's <laughs> art. You can't, you can't necessarily apply a timeline to art. Um, but it, in, in all seriousness, I would say the most important thing is to finish the book. And then you can start thinking about editorial. Then you can start thinking about critique groups. But you have to write the story. Write the whole book. You got to write the whole book and, and because you can't do anything with just chapters. Now, obviously, if you find, if you can find, if you join, um, Mystery Writers of America or International Thriller Writers or, um, RWA used to have Romance Writers of America used to have an absolutely astounding new writer program. And, and every, every organization, every writing organization has something for the new writers for, for their debuts to try to help them learn. Um, take some classes. There's absolutely nothing wrong with saying, hey, I know I want to tell a story, but I don't know how to do it. You know, go to a writer's conference, go to international thriller writers. If you want to write a thriller, here's yeah. here is the best thing to do. Okay. If you want to write a thriller, international thriller writers in New York every summer, it's summer camp for thriller writers. You will meet every major name in the industry and they have a whole day session called Craft Fest hmm. where these luminaries teach classes on how to write. Do that. If Definitely. you can go to Craft Fest, you will walk out with every tool you could possibly need to finish a novel. I mean, it's it's an, it's a really cool experience. All right, and I'm liking this. Now things are coming together. King okay, George's, sorry. King Elizabeth George's Craft Fest, write a whole manuscript, do the work, 
do the now work. Now shred it, right? So some between some balance of critique groups and editorial, yeah. kind of shred it, work it, rework it. Um, Make it the best it can possibly be. When do you know then, you're ready to query? Yeah. When do you know? I mean, that is the, that's the question, right? That is the question because, you know, we can work on a book. A, we can, we're never done. Let me, let me put it that way. You're never done. Even books that are already out. I could fix things in them. Yeah. Um, so when you have a consensus from the people around you who are reading the book and say, you know what, this is pretty good. I think it's ready. When you yourself have given it everything that you possibly can, then you can go ahead and start looking at trying to get an agent and going on submission and putting together the dreaded query letter. Sure. And again, the organizations are another brilliant resource for how to do that. Sure. And yeah, and I always tell people in nonfiction, there is a way this works. Please don't invent your own process. You know, just do right. the thing that, yeah, do the, the for the way it's supposed to work. Don't, uh, don't think that you're going to be the first person to think like if I put it in a nice envelope and send it to uh, an editor, <laughs> they're going to read it and it's all bypass the agent or whatever. Um, right. Yeah. Don't it, make the mistake that I made. But I just feel like JT it. Ellison. Yeah. Okay. Don't feel like JT. <laughs> don't do what JT did. Um, and then if you query, okay. Well, so we query. Let's say you query widely and it, and it doesn't get picked up. Do you mm -hmm. start the next day on novel two? It depends on what happens in the query process. Now, some people will get back um, actual notes that people are, you know, if you've sent out 50 queries and you don't get any response, something's wrong with your query letter. If you send out 50 queries, you get 20 requests for partials. Yep. You send those out and you get nothing. Something's wrong with your work. Um, if you're lucky enough, you'll get someone who gives you a little bit of insight and says, this is why this doesn't work. They don't often do that. Okay. Um, it, it is very much, uh, you're kind of out there on your own trying to figure out, okay, well, that didn't work. Why? Right. Um, there is definitely a moment where it's like, okay, this book is not going to work. You know, that's what happened with my first one. My, uh, my agent was like, it's not going to work. We can rewrite it all you want, but it's, just intrinsically something about it's not landing for them. So try something else. I have a friend that did that eight times. Eight times she sent books out on submission and it was number eight that landed her the deal. And, and you know, she would get back the queries. They would say, you know, send us your next, send us your next book. She just wasn't quite there, but she would send it out and send it out. And that perseverance is what you need because this could be a very demoralizing industry, right? Yep. You, you get even at your level, even at my level, I get rejections all the time, right? I'll pitch an idea and they'll be just like, oh, JT, pat, yeah. pat. Yep. <laughs> no, <laughs> not going to work. And I mean, we all, we all have to do that. You have to grow a thick skin. You have to be disciplined. You have to respect your writing time and, and you have to understand that it's subjective. And if somebody says no, it only takes one yes. You can get a thousand no's. Yeah. It only takes one yes. Yeah, and that's often the way it goes. It, um, it really is. It's complicated. It's a it, you're you're going off of chapters if you're an agent. Um, and I often tell people, I don't know if you agree with this or not. I, I also say, look, agents are desperate for clients. Uh, mm -hmm. th they want clients. They need deal flow. Publishers are desperate for books they can publish. So um, if something is getting rejected, don't get into a mindset of these gatekeepers don't know anything and let me figure out like my, my in route, like they really want, they really want you to be a writer that they could sell. They deal flow is everything. And, and so, um, yeah, when they're saying this is close, but not quite yet, they want you to succeed. They want, they, I mean, they want you as a client, they want clients, they want clients who are moving books. Uh, and, and so if you think about them being on your side, as opposed to rejecting you because they just don't understand your art, at least psychologically, maybe that makes it, makes it a little bit easier. But that is, I mean, I think that is exactly the mindset that we have going into this when we're querying. It's like, oh, they just don't understand what I'm doing. Yeah. It's like, actually, they are pretty good arbiters of what the market will bear and they know what they can sell. All they want and, to do is sell. It, yeah. They, like, it, it sadly comes down to what they know they can sell. You can write the most spectacular book on the planet, but if it doesn't have witches in it, Tor is not going to buy it. 
<laughs> you know, it's right now, especially right now, you know, the, the Colleen Hoover asked domestic suspense is huge. Witches are off the charts. Everybody wants witches. Um, but they're also buying for what's happening two years from now. Yeah. This is a very future looking environment. They're trying to anticipate where the trend's going. Right. Everybody hops on the trend. But in the meantime, the agents are bringing in the new stuff. Like, here's the next thing. You want to be writing the next you thing. You want to be the next thing. Yeah. You want yeah. to be the next. You want to create your own market. That is, and it's hard to do. Um, that's why we, I, I say I like to zig. I like to zag when people are zigging because it's like, oh, no, I am not going to go jump on that bandwagon. I'm going to go try to do something else. Interesting. And uh, you're saying that's very different than the indie market right now because it's a, um, it's such a fast turnaround that you right. can jump on trends. You can say, here's a trend. And in uh, six weeks, I can have something that's like perfectly matched. It's like, yep. you just finished Colleen Hoover. Here's like exactly the same book. I have four of them right here. Like you can, so that's, that's the difference between those worlds. Uh, in traditional, you, you might want to be thinking about, hey, what's a really interesting high octane new approach or style or, or thing that I can introduce, which is different than what the KDP people are doing, which well, they might different. be doing that too, but there's a lot of sort of, uh, oh, they're uh, just re right now. Persephone's yeah. and Haiti retellings. That's the thing. Yeah. Everybody wants a Persephone and Hades retelling. Now, our market just finished its first really big round of Rebecca retellings. I mean, I fell into that market, you know, <laughs> whatever. We all had to do one. Um, but that's, you know, Agatha Christie books. Ruth Ware really has brought back the love of Ath Agatha Christie. And that, that that's what the market wants right now. They want like gothic cozy mysteries. Yeah. They want cozy mysteries. They want, but they want them in a modern view. They they don't want you know they don't want it set back at the vicarage and everything. They they yep. want it set in new places with new uh, new settings. You know the hacienda, really great Rebecca retelling in 1790s Spanish War. You know, totally, totally new. So that's something that this market has changed so much in the past couple of years. It's broadened. Um, we have a lot more diversity and a lot more diverse voices and stories and authors who are bringing their lens to these classics, which so is not, really, really cool. It's not always the same type of character in the exact same settings. Um, yeah, that's, that's yeah, these Yeah, if it's going to be a successful retelling, it has to be a reimagining yeah. of a classic. But those well, always do well. Well, this has been, I've gone, we've gone a little over, which I, I appreciate you tolerating, but I, I think this has been fascinating, uh, JT. I mean, we've learned a lot about uh, your story. We've learned a lot about the publishing industry, how someone, what it's actually like, how someone could make it uh, into the industry. I'm going to condense all of your advice to the following recommendation, write about witches. So I hope I have that. <laughs> I think and I got and that name, name your book, The Name of the Wind, and you'll be fine. <laughs> exactly. Yes. The Name of the Wind is written by Brandon Sanderson. Follow Brandon Sanderson's example with his famous novel, Name of the Wind, uh, but add <laughs> witches. <laughs> but add witches. Add witches. Actually, that would probably um, sell like mad. I, I think there's a lot of things he could do that would sell. Yeah. <laughs> it's like mad. Um, well, anyways, this has been great. So JT, thank you very much. Is there, let me, uh, let me let you conclude by saying if, if people want to find out more about all these great series, over 25 novels, which is um, amazing. You started right. Your first book came out after my first book around the same time. Yeah. And, the same time. Yeah. And I'm writing number eight and you're on 25. So I'm very impressed. Where do people find out more about this? They can come to jtellison.com. Everything I have is there. They can sign up for the newsletter and, you know, there are outlinks to the social medias if they want to find that as well. But uh, sign up for the newsletter. That's yes. that's where I'm at. That's what I'd recommend. Sign up for JT's newsletter so she doesn't have to dance on TikTok. Please. All right. Thank you, JT. <laughs> thank you, Cal. All right, Jesse. Well, there you go. That was my conversation with JT Ellison. Would you say you're you're about to uh, quit and go become a thriller writer? Are you inspired? I just always come back to like Neil Stevenson and just how he thinks about all the stuff that he writes about. I'm currently listening to one of his books on audio, Reemdy, and I'm just like flabbergasted like with every paragraph. Yeah, you're a big Stevenson fan. I like Stevenson. I just they just like think about everything. There's so much detail. Well, so this was one of the cool things that came out of this interview and not cool for the industry, but just cool bit of knowledge that there's this real divide, which I didn't really understand so well till I talked to JT. 
in the world of fiction writing, and let's put aside now literary fiction, the, you know, Jonathan Franzen trying to win awards type writing. Uh, but in the world of like more genre type fiction writing, you have this, the world of the Neil Stevensons and the John Grishams, uh, the, the people who can write one book a year or one book every few years and they're, and, and people know them and will wait for them and they have a big audience that'll buy them. And then you have this whole other world of the, the sort of genre, you know, romance, thriller, detective thrillers, all these subgenres like where, where JT lives. And man, I was surprised by how much they have to write. The fact that her first book deal was for three books a year. It's crazy. Like they just write, like mm. it's like this huge, and it, it almost, there's this interesting separation. And, and I'm sure uh, if you can jump from one to the other, that's uh, from the, the three books a, a year to the Stevenson, like one, like interesting book every two or three years is probably the, probably the ideal. But I didn't realize how much of the fiction world is actually much more really high volume that you have like a personal relationship with an author who's constantly putting out books and you're constantly reading. I mean, th that must be a cool connection these readers have with their writers, but man, definitely harder. On the other hand, if you're Stevenson, every paragraph has to be good, right? If like, yeah. this is my last book in the last three years, if that doesn't work, you probably live under the fear of like, I might have just lost half my audience. Where if you're, if it's one of three books, it's like, I like your characters. I like your world. And I'm just staying with you all year. So, I mean, maybe it's a, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side, but it's interesting that, that there was such a divide there. It's kind of similar with YouTube too. If you think about it, you have some channels that put out videos every day that are, you know, and then the other ones like Mr. Beast, who like a grand production and puts out like once a month. Yeah. And you're right. It's uh same trade-offs. So, uh, if you can do just one great one, in some sense, that's nicer to not be on the treadmill of having to produce every day. But if it's not so great, you could lose that audience pretty quickly. Like, what would it take? Like three bad Mr. Beast videos before it's been three months till I've seen anything interesting from this guy and I might, I might move on. Where if you do two videos a day, you know, who cares about three videos? Three days later, there'll be 10 more or, mm -hmm. or, or whatever. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It's the volume, volume versus big swing. And then I think the, the award caliber writers probably have it worse because there, it not only has to be good, it has to be critically acclaimed. Like their whole thing is built on this needs to be a like a critically acclaimed book. That's why people are buying it. Um, so then the pressure becomes impossible. Those are the those are the novelists I think who freeze the hardest. Are those who won the Man Booker or won the Pulitzer mm -hmm. and are like, oh my god, I have to deliver at that caliber. So they're just completely completely freeze. Mm -hmm. Interesting world though. I also like the specificity of some of her advice, you know, uh, get an editor, pay for an editor. I like that. That's like knowledge work coaching. If you're trying to get into this industry, mm -hmm. you need to be working with someone back and forth well before you're going to be ready to actually, uh, submit something. And I thought that was really interesting or a writing group that'll do that for you. But as she was saying, it can be hard at first to find those writing groups, but you can pay people by the hour who know what they're doing, who'll go through your chapter. And I think her advice of like, get a chapter to a point where a professional who you're paying says, yes, this is good. This is professional quality that it's like a cheat code. It's probably the fastest way to build up your writing chops to the right level of professionalism needed to actually deliver on whatever idea you have. Yeah, that's a good point. I thought that's cool because you know, often, so often we just hear the vague stuff, follow your dreams, write every day, you know, do national write novels, writers month or whatever. We don't get into the details of, okay, but how does that writing get good? What type of writing is going to actually sell? So I, I did enjoy that reality check from, from JT. Mm -hmm. uh, the one piece of advice she left off, which I think we agree is critical is to build a Brandon Sanderson style under underground hidden super villain layer in which to do your writing. Yeah, and he'll invite you over and then you can write the sequel. And then we'll write the sequel. Let's just say you don't write Name of the Wind without having a really great place to write in. So Jesse, I never miss an opportunity to alienate and confuse our fans. So there you go. All right, enough of that nonsense. Uh, JT, thank you very much. JTEllison.com. That's J-T-E-L-L-I-S-O-N.com to find out more about her. I appreciate her coming on the show. Thank you everyone for listening. We'll be back next week with a normal Q&A episode of the podcast. And until then, as always, stay deep.